This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics. We promise to do our best to keep it both insightful but brief. In this episode, we have uh, David Levelin, Director of Marketing EMEA at Apps Flyer. David, welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. Hey there, Tim. Thanks for having me. All right, great. So think about what helps us to deal with uncertain situations and certainly as harsh as the one we're fighting ourselves in today. It is hard data and it's analysis. It's important to have enough information about what happened in the past so we can zoom out, analyze it, and build your strategy for what to do now and in the future. So today we want to share with you kind of a recap of what happened in app marketing in 2019 and to advise your in-app marketing strategy to move forward with. We're going to be talking about aggregated app data, available tools, and more. But let's start with something else. Uh, David, tell us about yourself, please. Sure. So I'm uh, a marketing director for Apps Flyer in EMEA and been here for, it was a year yesterday. So it just uh, feels like about five years, but <laughs> um, just, been, just been the one year. It's been a crazy year. It's been an amazing year. I've been uh, a friend of this business for probably three, four, five years now, a client on and off for various companies and I'm always a big fan. So um, yeah, that's my that's my current role taking out you know mobile attribution and marketing analytics uh, portfolio to app marketers across EMEA. Prior to that I was an app marketer myself since you know kind of since apps came around. Very, very fortunate to work for a lot of wonderful businesses like Amazon, Skyscanner, Shazam, and uh, more recently Halo, My Taxi and now called Free Now, had a few rebrands in the last few years, that business. And uh, prior to that, you know, as apps were kind of just becoming a thing and, and when iPhone was launching, I was at uh, a business called Mobile Interactive Group that was uh, the, one of the sort of very first mobile marketing and mobile technology agencies in the UK. So I've always been in mobile and I always loved it. Yeah, just get very excited by how all this technology is and how much uh, enjoyment and productivity and fun and distraction and use and help and, and you know, everything it gives to, to, to so many people. Yeah, I see. Mobile is definitely a mixed bag these days. It's a combination of great things and quite often quite awful things. Um, <laughs> But you said from the very beginning, from like the day one, right? Yeah, I mean, I was I actually got into it when I was at university selling phones for uh, as a part time job, and you were seeing people like just seeing the first uh, cameras and the very first games coming out, and uh, even then, people were just sort of so blown away by a 0.3 megapixel camera even back then. So it's kind of just been exciting to see that journey all the way through to where we are now, which is you know kind of crazy where. We're, you know how much technology, you know what the techno, where the technology's got to, and, and also potential for where it's got to go as well. Exactly. Let's talk about the app categories now. Today, during a COVID nineteen pandemic, what app categories do you see growing, and which ones are falling? Yeah, sure. And so, when it comes to growing, the obvious category that I think probably won't be a surprise to anyone is, is gaming, and with that particular sort of category as a whole obviously there's many subcategories is enjoying a, a significant period of growth at the moment and that in itself is great but I would caveat that by saying that of course we use we use positive and growth in inverted commas here because of course we understand that there's a much more important human picture going on you know in the outside world so it's not that we're you know I'm not so no I don't think anyone's celebrating that per se but right. of course you know we also talk about the growth that's going through which is huge at the moment and and do so in good conscience knowing that actually the distraction and the fun that games provide during difficult times is is, is a really great thing for many people so gaming is going through a huge huge leap at the moment and particularly in the hyper casual casual space and also the social casino space the kind of more casual categories that that are more dip in dip out a bit more fun not your core gamer the core gamer categories in mid core and hardcore games have also seen a lot of growth but because they've got such a loyal fan base that growth isn't that sort of spike 
isn't as pronounced. It's still a lot of growth. It's slightly flatter than the, the very, very pronounced growth that we've seen in, in you know, in the hyper casuals. And, you know, we know all the titles, the candy crushes of this world and what have you, which have had a huge, huge big spikes recently as people, you know, spend a lot more time on their sofas and are looking for a bit of distraction. So, so gaming's definitely huge. Then, you know, there were some incredible stats that even when we, I was looking at kind of the, the report that we put out on a weekly basis that looks at all out categories, but the, there's a few that jumped out at me that were really just pretty amazing, you know, education apps growing nearly 300% over a six week period revenue in them growing 250%. There's dating apps, funnily enough, for growing significantly at the moment, which is, you know, it's slightly counterintuitive. Photography apps as well, um, which I would put down to the fact that people are probably, you know, wanting to share a lot more with friends and family. And then you've got, of course, health and fitness, as people have been not able to get to the gym, but not also physical fitness. Also, we're seeing you know, a lot of the, the mental health apps, the mindfulness apps that, that are doing very well. And of course, you know, a lot of productivity apps. So, you know, certainly when everyone first started working from home, all of the, the communications apps and the Zooms of this world and, and what have you would have all seen uh, huge, huge spikes. But, but what we saw was that that happened very quickly over February and March. And then there was a small correction and now it's kind of leveled off, um, but it's still significantly up from where it was before. So, yeah, a big growth in a number of categories. In terms of the ones that that, that have perhaps been hit hit harder or been hit, um, mm-hmm. we, we don't dwell on those too much. I think because those that have been hit have been been hit very badly, and it's it's difficult to you know I don't really want to spend time too much time dwelling on on the fact that they're going through through difficult times. But of course, travel and transport have been probably the most hardest hit. Um, but equally, what we've seen with particularly with some of the transportation apps is that they've adapted. Uh, they've done. They've moved to groceries and deliveries and and to, uh, that kind of thing. So there's some positives that have come out of even the very difficult challenges that some categories have have faced. Um, and uh, you know, I hope I hope for everyone's sake uh, and all the categories that that have faced tougher times recently that um, you know they're able to stabilise soon and, and and get back into growth mode. Yeah, it's it's great to see that people manage to adapt and uh, uh, restructure their business and make sure that they are still uh, pushing up and not falling down, even when it's that that hard. And like, obviously, nobody was expecting that this day may happen. So, and I'm sure dating apps are <laughs> staying alive because of the texting and uh, communication through the app. Yeah, it seems that people are wanting to, uh, you know, still, <laughs> still connect. Still want to get in touch, even electronically, yeah. somehow. Yeah, it's still working. It's good. I don't um, know why well at my age, but, um, but uh, I'm, I, 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 I'm sure there's good reasons why people are still enjoying connecting. You know, true, isn't it? Definitely, it's, it's working for Gen Z, <laughs> for millennials. <laughs> All right. So uh, just um, in terms of uh, timeline, if you're looking back specifically in March and April, can you see the same picture uh, for these two months in terms of what apps are going up and down or is kind of yeah, changing? It, like it was, it was very common across the world, actually. Certainly, obviously, in, in APAC, it happened uh, quite a lot sooner and happened in, uh, in December and January in particular. But when we look at Western Europe and Russia and um, and, and and also the states, which even you know, which the states were very late to lockdown, and I think it was right at the end of March that they locked down. But even then, prior to that, because I think a lot of businesses were locking down and people were starting to just to lock down themselves before the you know any government kind of regulation, we started to see really significant growth from I guess from the beginning beginning of you know, late February, but really early March was when it started. And then there's governments across Europe and Spain and Italy, which was sort of the second week in February, and then the UK following a week or two later, uh, and then the States a week or two after that. March was really where there was just this incredible spike, and that really sustained for, for a good number of weeks. And then, and then mm-hmm. like I said, corrected a little bit, but it still remained um, significantly up overall from where it is. Where it is. And we, we now see it being relatively stable, uh, and depending on the category, of course, you know, it's still, still up a good a good chunk on where it was beforehand all right i see now you know like every app growth manager there's always a question how much money should i spend to acquire a new user and uh, there's always this um, balance or kind of a battle between getting uh, new installs through the pay channels or native traffic so if we're looking at the kind of a, a meta data meta picture 
of now in terms of what's the ratio between organic and non-organic app installs? How does it change over time? Like if you're looking at small apps and big brands, uh, is there is this picture different in terms of how much money they should they have to spend on right. the app installs these days? So the prior to prior to COVID nineteen, what we were seeing in the last twelve to eighteen months was definitely a shift towards paid user acquisition being one you know being increasingly important in your mix of paid versus organic. The reason for that being a number of things, you know, it's just a very competitive market space. A lot of VC funding going in, a lot of on digital businesses starting to invest in mobile and user growth, and of course a lot of businesses as well prior to. Um, you know, later in 2019, a lot of businesses were, were running very aggressive user acquisition, audience building business models where they weren't necessarily as concerned about profitability. I think that's changed uh, a lot in 2019 with some quite high, high profile challenges that some 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 big tech businesses that had, had a lot of VC funding had, and that has a trickle down effect onto earlier series A, series B, series C businesses where management teams and boards, you know, start expecting to see a little bit more rigor, a little bit, a bit more scrutiny on the path, to, what their path to profitability is. And and mm-hmm. I think the market, which was very frothy previously, um, certainly, you know, we expect, we expected it prior to COVID and then we certainly expect it going forward to, to, to become more about sustainability and quite rightly so. Uh, and about measurement and, you know, making sure that you're getting the return on investment and that you have a model that can be sustained over many years and that can sustain crises because, of course, we're seeing that they can come along. We were definitely seeing whether it was small apps needed to invest more to cut through because you don't have the uh, organic weight of, uh, you know, word of mouth and maybe above the line advertising to, to prop up your app store downloads. And you've probably got a newer team by definition as well. So you're kind of learning. And so you have to pay a little bit more to start scaling your base. Um, but even with bigger app categories, you know, the, the more established scale-ups and, and, and really, really large apps that are out there, they were still having to invest more and more money um, over the last 18 months to, to acquire users versus where they used to be um, maybe two to three years ago where they could rely a little bit more on organic. We saw overall a growth from around about 51% um, in 2018 of paid versus uh, organic uh, to mm-hmm. 58 in 2019. So a growth of about 14% year on year in terms of how many, how, what percentage of your user base is um, it, you've, had, you've had to pay to acquire versus relying on organic. So definitely seeing that as being an overall trend. In the last two, three months since, uh, you know, the current situation happened, everything's changed because I think, you know, really there's no one rule anymore. Some apps are doubling down and are are investing very, very heavily at the moment because the media rates have become a lot cheaper and they're seeing it as a great opportunity to grow and to, to take advantage of cheap media rates and maybe even get back on TV, for example. Um, other app categories are shutting up shop, really, you know, tightening their marketing budgets and actually saying, you know what, let's either focus on organic and uh, do a really good job there, or let's focus on reactivating because reactivating can often um, be cheaper than acquiring new users. Um, and I, I would imagine that is a, not going to be a mid to long term strategy. I think that is really just a short term reaction to what's happened, just people tightening up in the very short term, while, while, while everyone and every business comes to terms with what's happening, works out what it means to them, models what um, the impact on their revenue is of any contraction or growth, and, and then works out you know where they go going forward. So I don't, I don't think that kind of tightening up of budgets is a long-term thing per se. It's just at the moment we, we, we saw originally a, you know, a lot of talk in the market, people being quite conservative, um, but others, like I say, being very aggressive. So it's a whole mix now. There's no, there's certainly no rules at the moment, no no, um, no one size fits all in that respect. I see, David. I've got the picture. Speaking of reactivating, let's talk about retargeting a little, a little bit. Has retargeting, because uh, it's been one of the most effective ways uh, for uh, app marketers to acquire new users, what can you say about the current state of uh, retargeting? Um, is there any room for more retargeting at campaigns? Yeah, I think what we see is about uh, in non-gaming, we certainly see it being very un- underutilized in gaming, mm-hmm. and that's likely down to the unit economics. It can be very challenging, but the ones, the, the companies that we do see doing it, which is around about 20% of gaming companies run retargeting, we do see very significant increases in, uh, in ARPU 
so incremental, you know, versus a control group that weren't retargeted. For non-gaming verticals, it's more like about 36, 37% of, of apps that are running retargeting. And my personal opinion is that that's very low. I think it's surprising that more apps aren't running some form of retargeting, even if it's not a significant chunk of your budget. And it really depends as well, of course, what we how we define retargeting, because some people would you know, there's a couple of different forms, right? You can you can call it part of the acquisition funnel where you might have an abandoned shopping basket and then you retarget to try and get them to, to come in and then it's still part of the acquisition process. And then you've yeah. got reactivation and re-engagement, you know, which might be someone who's lapsed three or four months ago and you actually want to go and try and see if you can reactivate them and get them back into your app. So either way, we, we definitely what our data shows is it's growing still the use. But it's um, it's not growing as much as um, I think it could be, and I think there's there's a, a, a data on incrementality shows that um, you know there could be a missed opportunity for apps there. So I'd definitely be encouraged encouraging app um, marketers, particularly at the moment when reactivation might be cheaper than new user acquisition, be testing that and really trying to see if they can make that work. Got you. Now, the marketers are just human beings; they're not superheroes. They're, there's no way they can stick little more tasks into their uh, working day. So there's no way they can perform their uh, marketing activities without automation. So marketing automation, it's kind of given, it's been part of the marketing routine for a number of years. As of now, what areas of app marketing automation is available and what tools are out there for app marketers to make their work more efficient uh, so they can sleep better at night? I think good news is that there's tools out there for almost everything that you could want to do with your app now. And and also most, you know, the vast majority of those tools are really robust, solid enterprise grade software. Um, And and anyone who's been doing this as long as I have, you know, kind of will remember that that wasn't always the case. And it was often a real pain to get new tech integrated. And then the tech would be wobbly. And if it wasn't the tech, it was the the ecosystem itself. So the, the operating system you're building on, or it was the hardware, you know, it was flaky. And, and, and it was always quite painful, I think, when people started introducing a lot of MarTech and new SDKs into their apps. Um, that's, that's no longer the case. I think that, you know, the ecosystems and operating systems have been very solid and the hardware has been very solid for a good while now. And, 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 and the MarTech that, that sits around it is is also very solid. So that's the kind of good news. The challenge is that, you know, by having so many different solutions available, it can be very difficult to decide what what to use, where to start, how to make them connect well and make them play well together. And there's no, again, there's no real one size fits all for everyone. It's all about where you are in your stage of growth, what your budget is, uh, how much resource you have in your tech and engineering team to do this, and also how efficient you are internally in by making things like this happen. If, you, if you're well aligned with your products and your engineering teams, then and you have you know shared KPIs, for example, then you have a really good chance of quickly integrating the right tech, you know, working out what the right stack is between yourselves and, and working together to get it in. If you don't have that alignment internally, you're going to have that typical bun fight as to what gets resourced on the roadmap. And and, and ultimately, you know, you probably try and do too much and do everything very slowly. And it's all quite painful because uh, that's the, that, 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 that kind of old um, siloed model just doesn't just doesn't work well for introducing new tech and building out a robust tech stack. So for me, it's just about, you know, being aligned with your team internally and then working out what the right tools are for your budget and for your for your objectives. Personally, my personal favorite, because I think, you know, for marketers, it's probably the easy tool to get done is, you know, is, is the CRM tools that are, around, are out there around automation. And I, I've you know, I'm a big, big fan of Braze, but I, you know, there's a lot of great CRM tools out there like Leanpum, Squirt. Um, all of those tools offer uh, marketers a really fantastic way of automating a lot of the user journey, a lot of the onboarding flows, a lot of your comms uh, in a way that if you build it in-house, you lack a lot of the segmentation capability, a lot of the flexibility, a lot of the deployment speed. And so, so one of the places I would start if I was an earlier app would certainly be around my CRM. Um, but you know, really, there's there's tools all through the stack, you know, and, and you can't ignore your BI and analytics. Obviously, I'm going to say uh, marketing measurement as well is very very important. And you know, it's 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 really just a question of prioritizing it and uh, working out what's you know what you can do with your team and your budget. Great. Looking 
broadly uh, the app market in the light of what happened uh, with the high profile tech last year. We all remember WeWork, Uber. What would you say to have developers and brands today? Like, can you kind of uh, hint to any lessons that they, they should learn? Like, is there any suggestion how they should, you know, change their perspective when, you know, doing a business uh, in general? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it will come down from the top because I think it will depend on on, on who your VCs are and, and their relationship with your board and your management team. So, you know, if, if people got scared by what happened last year, then you'll soon hear about it. You know, that it will trickle down and, you know, you'll be told about, you know, whether it's uh, tightening budgets or different KPIs or different focus within the business. That'll all come down. Um, you know, very quickly uh, and, and will have probably already have happened. But um, I don't, it's, it's really difficult to kind of say with regards to if we take something like an Uber, uh, you know, and I've worked in the on-demand mobility space for a long time. If you take an example of that that space, it's really easy to look at those business models and say, you know, they're, they're, they burn a lot of cash, they take a lot of investments, they're um, generally low loyalty products if someone comes along with something cheaper and a good app then you've got a tough time to keep your your base it's very easy to kind of look at all those kind of models and say do you know what they they're expensive business models but the reality is that if drive you know driverless automated driving comes along in the next year or two they become very valuable businesses overnight you know and and that technology really isn't far away so so it, it it's really about what what your strategy is as a business if your strategy is to go after audience development um and have a long-term strategy and that you you know your board and your vcs and your you, whoever your investors are even if you're public are supportive of that long-term view then you might run a less you know a less profitable business model short term and that might that's absolutely fine as long as that's a conscious decision rather than one where you're trying to you know, where you're taking a lot of risk on and trying to build audience and um, perhaps, you know, not you're not in a position where if the market conditions change or if a capacity comes along, then you're not able to survive, then that, that's a very different um, question. But yeah, easy to criticize some of the big, big businesses, but ultimately if they have supportive investor bases and, and their long-term plays, particularly if you look at, like I said, an Uber, for example, you know, driverless cars come along uh, at some point soon. That is a very valuable business, as are many of the other mobility as a service apps. So um, it's a difficult one, but it's all really about your, your your investors and what they're willing to take and what how much risk they're willing to, to take on. Yeah, exactly. I, I think for Uber, self-driving cars, uh, the whole um, technology is kind of a... It's, it's really crucial if they will not be able to... Um, jump on this bank wagon first, uh, they will have a really hard time competing with somebody who has cars that are driving themselves and there's no driver sitting um, uh, at the wheel. So yeah, at this scale, technologists uh, are can be really game changer. Like if you're trying to be competitive and be a leader in this space. Um, so yeah, the yeah. is already there. The tech is already there to drive cars safer than humans drive cars. That's, that's, give or take pretty much it's it's yeah. regulated it's you know the regulation just isn't there to support it we as humans aren't willing to give up our cars and, and accept that the car we've just bought or invested in is now worthless and there's just a whole long path to get through us as humans rather than you know it's um you know computers don't get distracted by their phones and read text messages when they're driving or or, or drink drive or drive tired exactly. or anything so, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting five or 10 years um, in that space for sure. Absolutely. Now, I have a, a few quick questions for you specifically. So yeah. here we go. Uh, are you iOS or Android person? I've always been Android, and, but I am wobbling a little bit at the moment. But I've always been Android. I've liked the configurability. Yeah, I see. So yeah, it's it's a new thing because uh, up till now the iOS camp was bigger, but I think we're getting uh, Android one uh, <laughs> getting bigger as well. So do you remember your first uh, mobile phone? 
Yeah, I do. It was in about 1999. It was a little silver Panasonic. I can't remember the the model. It was very cool, very sexy. And within about two months, I'd failed to pay my bill and got it cut off. And I still carried it around just because it looked so cool. But I I don't even think I could make calls on it for like three months because I didn't pay my bill. So I remember it very well, but I also remember it being a very painful debt and a very painful lesson to learn at the age of about 18, 19. (laughs) Let's see. What is your favorite app today? So I am a huge fan of all of the audio apps, really. I think for me, I listen to a lot of music. So with Spotify, SoundCloud, Audible, but I also include Headspace in my audio apps. But, but you know, really Spotify, SoundCloud and, uh, and Audible for me. If I had to pick one, um, Audible is, is just something I love and I've been a subscriber for many, many years. But I, I love, love all three of those apps. And I've still remained true to, to Twitter. You know, ever since uh, I think mm. I joined, ever I joined, I've always been a huge Twitter fan, and uh, come and go with the other the other social platforms. But Twitter, I enjoy a lot. So, but Audible, if I had to pick one, I think. I see. Uh, now it's kind of a, the opposite question. Uh, sort of, uh, do you see the app that in your estimate kind of overrated? There's a, there's too much hype about the app, but it kind of doesn't deserve it. No, no app in particular, because I think it's all um, down to personal preference. I definitely, you know, at 40 years old now, I, I feel like I'm not relating terribly well to some of the newer social apps. I try to use them. I struggle to see what the attraction is. I even find the user experience a little tricky. But I think that's more just probably me being a bit of a dinosaur rather than anything the apps are doing wrong. I think the apps that, that upset me a little bit, I think there's probably two. I think the ones that uh, the e-com apps that don't invest properly in building the user experience out and they just squeeze a kind of online catalog into an app and, and, and it's generally a dreadful experience. They definitely irritate me. And uh, I think as well, sometimes some of the platform apps, you know, the big operating systems themselves who have a lot of apps, a lot of their own apps, I often find they're some of the worst worst designed apps. Um, I won't name any names, but I kind of struggle to understand how with all the data they have and the expertise and the software engineers, how they managed to make such horrible user experiences with some of their apps. But I won't name any names. I'll be diplomatic. All right. Got you. Now, what new app technologies are you most excited about? What technologies that you could see on the horizon and you're excited when they're going to be you know, the reality, not just the concept? Do you know what? I, I, I don't genuinely don't think there are tons of new technologies out there at the moment. I think we've been through in the last five years a real huge kind of burst of lots of different bits coming onto the scene, whether it's, you know, I know Bluetooth has been around for a long time, but it is at least now you've got a lot of Bluetooth headphones in the last five years. And, you know, a lot of these technologies that we have now built into the phones are have been established technologies for a few years. So I wouldn't say they're new. I think it's more about the use case and how they're being implemented and the fact that they're getting more robust. So I definitely really like Bluetooth and, and the way Bluetooth works with, with headphones. That's definitely been been something I think a lot of people have appreciated in the last two or three years. And then I think anything that adds convenience, uh, similarly to Bluetooth, I really like fingerprint login. So that for me, to be able to turn my phone on without even blinking, log into my banking, so I'm really, really fan of anything that just makes the experience more convenient, I think is is, is exciting. But there, there, I wouldn't really say there's any, those are kind of more features. There's nothing particularly uh, new technology that's that's super exciting. I, I, like I said earlier on, I'm, I'm really excited to see where the driverless car space goes in in the, in coming years. But I don't think that's something that's there today. And it's it, it could be many, many years, if not decades, before we see that. But yeah, if I had to pick one thing, I... I I just love finger, you know, fingerprint login. I think it's just so convenient and easy. And yeah, it sort of took away that sort of swipey pin code thing that we were doing for a year or two, right? Yeah, definitely. I, I hear you. I, I love uh, the uh, fingerprint technology and uh, face recognition as well. It's uh, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, and that was the last question. But before I let you go, uh, how can people get to know more about what you do? Uh, visit appsfire.com. Have a good look at, you know, we've got a, uh, we've got an amazing portfolio of tools for mobile marketers, whether it's measurement, analytics, or engagement. In terms of me personally, I'm there on LinkedIn. I, I you know, happy to speak and chat to anyone and you know really just i think there's just lots of fantastic resources out there in the mobile marketing space to to, to learn and listen if you're a, a sort of growing mobile marketer well, no, not necessarily myself but you know the many many people who who do um really great stuff out there the, the people who 
you know, the Thomas Petis, Andy Carvel, Eric Seufertz. These are names a lot of people talk about, but there's a very good reason for that. And it's that they, they know their stuff very well. And, you know, really, if you're growing and learning, whether you're just setting out or whether you're sort of at a really advanced level, that you can learn a lot from from these people and, and, and many of the other um, thought leaders in the space. So um, definitely, uh, if you want to learn more about AppSwire, join us on, a, on our website or get in touch with me on, on LinkedIn. But otherwise, get into some of the many great uh, Slack channels that are out there, like Mobile Dev Memo. Um, I know that Feature has a great ASO conference website, if that's what you're into. And just get involved in the communities because there's so many great people there with uh, lots of interesting stuff that they enjoy sharing. Uh, on the gaming side, UA Society is a fantastic organization as well. And, and there are many of these. Yeah, great. That, that's a great advice. Thanks a lot for your time, uh, David. Thanks for coming my, on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. And that was David Levelin, Director of Marketing in me at AppSquire. To listen to more episodes, subscribe here on podcast in iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Just search for Business of Apps and you will find us easily. Once you subscribe, you'll be able to get new episodes on your smartphone, tablet, or computer as soon as we release them. And please don't forget to leave us a review and comment. It is highly appreciated. And all episodes will also be available on businessofapps.com. Till the next time, bye. This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com.